I'm Alex Brink in New York, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Big Blue's big deal. IBM looks to the cloud with a $33 billion acquisition of Red Hat. Plus, Brazil's hard pivot to the right. Former Army Captain Jair Bolsonaro's commanding victory on the back of a social media storm. We'll look at the role technology played in the poll. And tech recoils from Gab. The two-year-old social media platform is at the center of a storm against extreme ideology as it promotes itself as a haven for free speech. A look at the role it's played in the Brazil poll and the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting is ahead. But first, to our top story, IBM has thrown its hat into the cloud computing ring. The company is buying open source software pioneer Red Hat for $33 billion. It's one of the biggest technology deals ever. The CEOs of both IBM and Red Hat spoke to Bloomberg earlier about the sale. We've been working with IBM for many, many, many years, and really over the course of this entire year, uh, we started to do, to do more together. Uh, we made some big announcements at May um, at our summit, uh, more work that we're doing together. Jenny and I really started speaking more seriously back in April, uh, and so it's been something that's just kind of continued to evolve and, you know, it just became a natural next step. Uh, in terms of what's, uh, why we see so much value for Red Hat is we do see tremendous opportunities opportunity for open source in the enterprise and as the leader there we see just a large market and a growing market in front of us. What we have lacked is scale in our go to market. We've lacked the depth of customer relationships because again we're a newer player kind of coming up. We've lacked deep industry vertical expertise and yet you know, we lack just the overall level of investment we need to meet our full potential. IBM brings all of that. So together we can dramatically accelerate the Red Hat business and what we do to Day, and then together be able to offer unique offerings that can continue to grow IBM's business as well. So, so Ginny, what about from your point of view, from the point of view not just of IBM but of Ginny Rometty, because a lot of people said IBM needs to make a move. This is a big move. This is going to be, if not your biggest move, one of your biggest moves during your tenure as CEO. Why did you decide this is going to be your legacy, or at least an important part of your legacy? Well, we've been reshaping IBM for this moment. And this is, to me, all about resetting the entire cloud landscape. And this is the inflection point to do it. Because if you look at our clients, chapter one of the cloud's over. They've moved the easy 20%, the cost saving that they wanted to get done. That's done, but the 80% ahead, that is a $1 trillion market, and this is the moment, and to go after it, they need a hybrid cloud. They need what Jim and I do together. They need hybrid meaning on-prem, a private cloud, many public clouds. They need it based on open standards. They tell us they're tired of the lock-in. The other clouds are often a lock-in. We are the true open source, the portable answer for them. And we need to manage multiple clouds. And they also have data now spread everywhere that we can securely pull all together. So this next chapter is a one trillion market. 80% of their workloads are gonna move. Jim just talked about our industry expertise, our services, our ability to do that, and we're going to give them that answer. So we catapult ourselves into number one. And, and you have to remember, Jim, Linux, IBM, open source, we together are the biggest contributor to the open source community. We have a long history and legacy of that. And Linux is the starting point for the cloud, and it's a destination. So when I say phase two, we own the starting point and the end point now. That is a great move for IBM, and it's why it's so really accelerating all of IBM and good for our, our high value model. IBM Chairman and CEO Ginny Rometty and Red Hat CEO James Whitehurst speaking earlier with Daybreak Americas. Now, let's take a deeper dive into the deal now with Daniel Ives, Managing Director of Equity Research at Wedbush Securities and Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Software Analyst, Anurag Rana. And Anurag, I want to start with you. I mean, you remember the days when I covered this company back in 2013 to 2015. She's saying now is the inflection point to cloud. Some folks might argue that inflection point already happened. What do you take of her finally kind of making this admission that they can't build it in-house and they got to buy it? 
I think she, they should have done an acquisition like this a long time ago when you and I were talking in those days. Now, they didn't do that. They were hanging their hat on Watson. Um, that hasn't really done much for their cloud business, I think. But, you know, this thing in principle can really reshape a lot of the things that they do. It can reshape their software practice, and it can also reshape their global business services practice where, you know, they have lagged companies like Accenture and Deloitte and Capgemini in terms of growth rates. And that global business services practice is still a majority of revenue, Dan. When you think about um, how this business does get integrated, um, Ginny made her name on that services side, integrating PwC Consulting back in the day. How much pressure is on her to actually have a seamless integration with Red Hat into the broader culture? culture and product fit for IBM. Hey, Mook, there's a lot of heat in the kitchen for them to integrate this successfully. And definitely, it comes with risks, but obviously opportunities, as, you know, as he talked about, because right now for cloud, they needed to make a big strategic bet. You know, if you look at it, there's VMware, Red Hat, a handful of others, but if they were going to do it, they need to do it now. Definitely a few years too late, but the integration is going to be the key for the street. And also looking at competitively, you know, like how does this affect Microsoft, Amazon, a two horse race in cloud? Can IBM become that number three player? That's sort of the key here. So, who is shaking most in their boots right now uh, seeing this acquisition? Is it Amazon? Is it the number one leader? Who is most fearful of a combo of IBM and Red Hat? Yeah, I mean, Amazon and Microsoft continue, they're drinking cap cappuccinos right now. I mean, it, it, it <laughs> continues to be their world and everyone else is paying rent in terms of cloud. But I think fundamentally speaking, it's the smaller players. I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of consolidation, Cloudera, Hornetworks. I think that's just the start. You're going to see a lot more M&A in cloud and there's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of smaller players, as you know well, the scale, that's really going to be the issue with uh, these two players coming together. And that did seem to be um, what uh, those two executives did talk about. Red Hat has the growth, but the small size, IBM has the scale, but as we know, revenue's fallen by about a quarter since Ginny mm. took over in 2012. Do investors now uh, look at IBM as a growth story? They're reigning in buybacks. They're not giving out as much cash. Does this change the narrative for them? Once again, we talked about it about you know six, seven years ago that they shouldn't be doing financial lending. You should be buying more companies like this. Um, this does give them a lot of good products to sell to the market. I think uh, you know the one that we think can actually happen is it could benefit somebody like an Amazon or Microsoft or Google because you could shift more workloads to the cloud. And uh, the, the, the question for me is really, do they really, are uh, are they going to be really open in terms of working with these Red Hat products to move some of that products to other clouds and not just go out and say, hey, why don't you move this to IBM's cloud? I think that really is a big thing because um, if they're not open, I think that could be a, an issue. Well, because Red Hat's already working with Amazon, yeah. they're working with Microsoft's Azure. Um, I guess, how, does, is that a cultural shift for IBM to say, look, our, our products have to be kind of cloud agnostic. Do they have to kind of change their DNA to make that work? They have to, I mean, there is no way out of it. We have seen with Microsoft, that is the only way to show people that you are agnostic to whoever the end party is and you're going to work with everybody else, you try to stick in your own technology in between, I think they will be in for a surprise. And, and I want to come back to your point that you made, Dan, about software acquisitions. I cover the M&A space. Everyone's talking that software is probably where it's at. Semiconductors are, are kind of slow for their own reasons. In terms of, of uh, the knock-on effects of this deal, who do you think should be looking at who's out there as a potential target? Which of the big tech companies uh, will need their own red hat, let's say, to uh, to be in the mix. Yeah, well, I, I think right now you look at uh, the core tech players that are going out there. I mean, obviously, like Microsoft, Oracle, Cisco, you look where, where everyone's looking. I think right now you look at names like Pivotal in terms of some players that could be consolidation candidates. And, and the new IPOs are getting picked off every other day. Look, that's part of it. And look, in, in this dislocation, this is what we've been telling investors, a lot of these stocks could be down 30%, 40%. You have strategic as well as financial buyers with their, with bids. So I think what this does do is it puts a bid in the sector. It shows where sort of the valuations are in terms of M&A on the cloud space. And I think this is definitely a positive, but now it really comes down to rubber meets the road. In other words, what are the ramifications for the deal? Is IBM successful? And can they be number three player? And what are the impacts in the space? And quickly here on the M&A front, valuations have been really high. That's what's kept strategics on the sidelines. They haven't been buying, but with GitHub and, and this deal uh, at a nice premium, does this change the narrative for buyers? Are they opening their pocketbooks now? Yeah, we 
believe you're going to see a surge in M&A over the next 12 to 18 months. Now is the window. I think you saw Microsoft GitHub with Red Hat. This sort of, in our opinion, sort of that tip of the sphere in terms of M&A. And, and we've heard, Anurag, uh, Jenny always says um, everything's underpinned by security. Uh, how much will security play a part in this new kind of hybrid strategy that they're pushing with this Red Hat app, uh, acquisition? I would say both security and privacy would be the single most important thing uh, because you're moving data from one ecosystem to another ecosystem. It has to be protected at rest. It has to be protected while it's in transit. Uh, well, great stuff here. I know we'll be continuing to watch and hear from both of you on how this acquisition gets integrated into IBM. That's Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities, Managing Director for Equity Research, and Bloomberg Intelligence's Anurag Rana. Thanks for joining. More unrest at Snap. The company has lost its vice president of U.S. sales, Kristen O'Hara, after she was promoted to chief business officer. But then CEO Evan Spiegel changed his mind. Sources tell Bloomberg Spiegel went as far as notifying O'Hara's direct reports of the promotion, but just two days later rescinded that offer, instead hiring Jeremy Gorman, who used to oversee ad sales at Amazon. Now O'Hara is the latest executive to leave the social media platform, telling colleagues in a statement Monday she's leaving due to changes in team structure. And coming up, looking ahead to Facebook's third quarter earnings and a discussion on the impact of the UK's digital service tax on big tech next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. PlayStation 4 is like the video game character that can't be defeated. Five years after its debut, Sony's $300 console is enjoying one of the strongest product cycles seen in the business. This isn't thanks to a steady stream of the popular game titles, which has helped the Tokyo-based company ship twice as many PS4s as Microsoft's Xbox One. That puts Sony's franchise in a strong position to counter the $34 billion console industry's next challenge, games delivered via the web. After years of predictions that cloud-based gaming would make hardware obsolete, the technology finally appears close to being ready. And looking ahead to Facebook earnings out Tuesday, the social media giant is expected to report third quarter revenue of $13.8 billion. That's up 34% from a year earlier. However, those cheery projections belie a quarter of term oil, including executive departures, a huge privacy breach, threats of regulation. And now the UK government is proposing a digital service tax that targets $512 million from companies like Alphabet and Facebook. Joining us from Portland is Brian Weezer, who covers Facebook for Pivotal Research, and joining me in New York, Bloomberg News reporter Sarah Ponzek. And Sarah, I want to start with you. I feel like tech investors have been waiting for things to turn a bit cheerier, and yet this October has been uh, as scary as the Halloween month uh, potentially promised. What exactly is going on here? Are investors just uh, kind of tired of these FANG stocks? It's been very ugly. I mean, there's a couple things going on. One thing you can say is you can couch it as this momentum trade in a way unwinding because of of course, a lot of these big tech names are all momentum names as well. And if you look at the momentum factor, it has really been taking a hit this quarter. So if you look at the New York FANG stocks and that index taking a hit and the S&P 500 information technology sector as a whole. So some are saying that, yes, they are more exposed to China in trade. At the same time, you keep hearing about these different regulatory issues. So we have some issues on the single company front, but also very much at large as you just see these names get pulled down as a whole. And when you say uh, folks are rotating out of this momentum trade, that makes me wonder, is this bull market coming to kind of its fruition if folks aren't so excited about these fast movers? How much uh, underpinning this is, are people trying to kind of mitigate risk or uh, folks looking at this up into the right action and saying, maybe it's time that it's finally over? We are starting to see a lot of risk mitigation, but I wouldn't necessarily say that investors believe that this bull market is over. Some people were worried just because of the fact that tech has been so important 
to this bull market. But as we have seen this rotation out of some of these very large tech names, we've also seen a rotation into value. And even if you looked at some of the performance today, you see names like financials, like utilities, like consumer staples, some of these more classic value plays or defensive plays really getting a bid. So I think investors do feel a bit relieved that other sectors of the market can take this leadership position as tech in a way uh, fails off. And Brian, I want to dig into one of those names. Obviously, Facebook is uh, set to report earnings on Tuesday. What in particular are you watching and, and how much was that big sell off last quarter kind of haunting investors as they're uh, looking to those results? Well, in terms of what I, I'd be looking for, it's just ongoing commentary about their uh, what should be a continuous expense increases and deceleration of revenue. And it's really just about the pace at which both are occurring, at least as management expects it. I am not convinced that the company fully comprehends the scale of investment they need to make in terms of making the product uh, safe, for lack of a better word, for society, for advertisers, um, for everyone involved. Uh, and so I think that the, the risks are still to the downside there. Um, and that's not even getting into spending on content that they'll need if they want to actually play in real TV advertising budgets, which they do. Um, you know, in terms of the actual the, the downturn, I mean, I think to your, to your comments earlier, it has been more momentum driven more than anything. I think regulatory risk uh, is a factor, but I don't really feel that investors fully comprehend uh, how much is wrong with Facebook yet. And, and that's a big statement there. I guess where specifically do you think the street should be looking in terms of what you do think is wrong? Well, I mean, I think that they, everyone can form their own judgment if they lay out uh, the problems for themselves. I, I've listed what I call a, a taxonomy of mismanagement, uh, where I've described the company as structurally badly managed. And if you go through the dozen or so uh, groupings as, as I come up with them, uh, you'd really just start to question whether or not there aren't more risks. The other issue that investors aren't fully uh, comprehending uh, is the limit to growth for the total advertising market. That is not something that most investors understand. Anyone when modeling Facebook on an ARPU basis does not understand the advertising market. Advertising is not based on an ARPU. You have to look at the total wallets, the share wallet that they can capture from advertisers out there. And I think when investors start looking at the pool of available money from advertisers, they start to realize that they can't be modeling uh, Facebook the way they've been modeling it. And I think then that starts to cause a, a reset of expectations over the long run. So when you do look at where analysts are pegging um, Facebook for the upcoming quarter, last quarter they were surprised and obviously folks didn't like that. It was more than 100, about $120 billion in value got knocked off that stock in one day. In terms of analyst expectations, what are you looking at from an equities perspective for Facebook starting Tuesday? So what's interesting is when you speak with analysts, a lot of people just say that they hope it doesn't get any worse. Of course, there's going to be a lot of focus on expenses, exactly how Brian was just talking, because we need to see what Facebook is doing, how much they're spending ahead of the midterm elections, what they're doing about these privacy concerns, but also about active users, of course, engagement, what's going on there. So analysts are expecting a bit of a pickup in active daily users from 2.23 billion to 2.28. So we'll see if Facebook can meet because we know how ugly it got last time around. So Brian, when you look at Facebook, obviously Instagram has kind of been um, pushed into the limelight here as the main core Facebook product has had some issues. How much pressure is on Instagram to perform, especially in the context of, you know, under your, your saying of taxonomy of mismanagement, Instagram's leaders are now out the door. What are investors looking for out of that part of the business? Well, I think, first of all, investors are looking at the wrong things when they look at Instagram <laughs> because Instagram is an integral part of Facebook when it comes to the way they make money and the way that they're run, uh, notwithstanding the change in management. Uh, there's one sales force for the combined entity. There is one pool of advertising. Unless you believe they're going to take a $20 billion capital expenditure budget and fund it to build a rocket to Mars, establish a new economy and a new advertising ecosystem, there is one pool of advertising budgets that they can chase. And so Instagram is exposed to that just as Facebook is. And so as one pool of advertising, um, you know, it's the same issue on a combined basis. So we've had a lot of swings from some of the other tech giants that have reported uh, Amazon, et cetera. Are investors still looking for a kind of big volatility here after earnings? I would expect so. A lot of people were hoping that after Netflix, after Amazon, after Alphabet, I mean, they were hoping that we would get this boost in the market. And we obviously didn't. We had a couple misses on revenue. Netflix, even though they killed it, we just 
didn't get the boost in the market that many were hoping for. So I think a lot of people are looking to Facebook uh, tomorrow as well as Apple later on this week to say maybe those two can finally surprise to the upside and get us out of the funk. But if not, the damage could be just as much. So closely watching Facebook earnings is Brian Weezer from Pivotal Research and Bloomberg Sarah Ponzik. Thanks so much for joining us. Still ahead, delays for Bardi Airtel's planned IPO of its African unit. We'll have details shortly. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg has learned that India's second biggest wireless character, Bharti Airtel, is delaying a planned initial public offering of its Africa unit due to the term oil in emerging market stocks. The company, which is backed by billionaire Sunil Matal, was originally aiming to list the unit in London by March. But now it's pushed back that share sale by about half a year. It plans to seek an enterprise value of about $8 billion for the Africa business. That's according to people familiar with the matter. Walmart Sam's Club is looking to get high tech. The retailer is opening a test store in Dallas called Sam's Club Now, where shoppers will make all their purchases on their smartphones. Shoppers will also be able to use their phones to build shopping lists and navigate around the store. The location will feature electronic shelf labels that instantly update prices and augmented reality displays that can transform digital shopping carts into pirate ships. The tech savvy store shows how Walmart is putting more investment dollars behind its warehouse club chain. Universal Pictures had another strong weekend at the box office with the latest installment of its Halloween movie series. The horror flick beat the competition for a second straight week, bringing in about $32 million in North America alone. The studio says global earnings have already reached $172 million. Warner Brothers' a Star is Born with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga held on to that second slot with just over $14 million in ticket sales. Still ahead, Jair Bolsonaro swept to power in Brazil's presidential election on Sunday. We discussed the role that social media played in his win and what other countries should take from it. Plus, tech companies recoil from Gab for its link to the Pittsburgh synagogue shooter. And the debate over free speech on the internet is once again front and center. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Alex Brinka in New York, in for Emily Chang. Jair Bolsonaro swept to power in Brazil's presidential election Sunday, making a hard pivot to the right. Bolsonaro, a former army captain, campaigned on a right-wing platform of privatizations, liberal gun laws, and security. And the win promises to strengthen Brazil's ties to the United States. Bolsonaro's rise to power is notable as, much like that of President Trump, it benefited greatly from social media. WhatsApp is one of the main tools that Brazilian 
friends use to keep in touch with friends and family and do business. Increasingly, it's also a part of politics. A recent poll found that 44% of voters in Brazil use WhatsApp to read political and electoral information. The app also helped us spread alarming amounts of misinformation, rumors, and false news. Let's head now to Rio de Janeiro, where we're joined by Chris Taragulia via Skype, director of Agencia Lupa, a fact-checking platform. Chris recently co-authored a report on misinformation in Brazil and WhatsApp, WhatsApp's role in it. Also joining us from our Bloomberg Rio Bureau, Bloomberg reporter David Biller. And, and Chris, I want to start with you. 44% um, of Brazilians are on WhatsApp. That's where they're getting their political news these days. What did you find when you looked at the messaging that's actually going back and forth? How much is real and how much is, frankly, uh, what we call fake news? Well, it, we, what we see, it is a big, big uh, amount of misinformation uh, going back and forth on the WhatsApp system. Uh, we have analyzed about 50 images, for example, and out of those 50 images that we got actually um, to analyze, we only found that four of them were totally true. That is uh, like very little um, amount of good information um, going, um, being around in, in the WhatsApp in Brazil. That's the last a very, very low amount of good information. Four, four out of 50, four out of 50, that is very low. When it comes to where we've been concerned about disinformation, a lot of focus has been put on Facebook and Twitter, but it seems like these kind of more private conversation is where it's at. Chris, how concerning is this um, that these are kind of happening a little bit more out of the public eye, perhaps in group text, but you know, not on a public message board like Facebook or Twitter? Right. What we have noticed here in Brazil, we have just finished the election, is that we have spent about two years analyzing and uh, trying to figure out how to fight misinformation on Facebook, on Twitter, and Google, like the, the social media that we usually uh, read and reach, right, every day. And now we have uh, uh, this whole new world um, um, being opened up, That is that how do we fight misinformation on encrypted platforms such as WhatsApp and Telegram? That is something that we in Brazil didn't figure out very much and somebody else in, in somewhere some other part of the world might might need to figure out and David put this in context for us in terms of this election I mean uh, Bolsonaro was not necessarily right in front of the public eye before uh, this candidate cycle how much did this kind of groundswell of social media actually kind of change his ascent to power well, it's tough to know for sure, right, because WhatsApp, and I know it's not so popular in the U.S., but it, it's, uh, it's encrypted from end to end. And so you don't really know what the impact is. Um, you know, he, he is someone who built a very big social media following, both on Facebook and uh, on Twitter. And then a lot of the stuff, you know, goes through WhatsApp, but you really don't know how much. Um, and certainly there was much more concern about the use of WhatsApp and how it influenced the election in the first round. Um, you could probably speak, or Chris could probably speak better to that, but um, it seems as though it can kind of came down a bit in the second round after, uh, after the courts began reacting to this. There was a big bombshell uh, report saying that a company or companies were financing mass uh, WhatsApp messaging to people, to the Brazilian electorate. And that really uh, had a big impact on the first round, but we don't we, we don't know how much we we won't know how much it doesn't seem. Uh, what we do know is that tough talking does make for viral content, David. In terms of what he is is kind of pushing out there in terms of the messaging, how much it is is it tough talk, and how much is there actually policy behind some of the ideas around security, uh, gun laws, and and privatization that he's been really pushing. Well, you know, I would say that that's, that's an issue uh, not just re regarding Bolsonaro, but a lot of the candidates in this race entirely. It wasn't about policy proposals. This wasn't a race where everyone was out there saying, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and he was the only one, you know, with bluster. It was a lot of that on all sides. Um, I think that he, he's made clear where he stands in terms of traditional family values and, uh, and liberalizing gun ownership. Um, policies like that. Others say uh, his, his, he's always been fixated on the idea of uh, leveraging Brazil's economic growth by mining in the Amazon. That's something that you, you really didn't see much of during this campaign, but is nevertheless one of, uh, one of his big policy focuses, uh, as well as privatizations you guys mentioned a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. 
that's something that we didn't see as much in the race, but is a you know a cornerstone of the economic uh, you know model they're they're going forward with. Chris, I, you know I, I think it also does come down to a question of of how do you define fake news? I mean we're looking at uh, Gab, the uh, the the platform that's pushing a lot of kind of far right information. It has been present here and uh, down in Brazil. A lot of um, the followers of of the new chief down there are on Gab as well. How do you kind of parse through what's real? and what's not in the context of news around an election as important as this one? So there are many platforms right now popping up with uh, dirty information. And what we do is that uh, we actually have a methodology that is um, is part of the IFCN, it's the International Fact Checking Network, and it is being uh, spread all over the world right now. And what we did, for example, this weekend on Saturday and, and Sunday, we uh, had a like an initiative, a, collab a collaboration between all the platforms that are doing fact checking here in Brazil. And just to give you an idea we actually worked and for 24 to 48 hours long and we debunked about 50 articles that mm -hmm. were uh, fake false information that's a lot that gives us uh, a, a, a ratio of one lie per hour in the last weekend of election in Brazil that is a lot Chris Tarodagula of Agencia Lupa and Bloomberg's David Biller, thank you both for joining. And speaking of Gab.com and the role it played in the Brazilian election, the social network is now under scrutiny here in the U.S. Gab is a two-year-old social network that builds itself as a free speech alternative to other social platforms. Here in the U.S., it's been a haven for white nationalists, neo-Nazis, and other extremists. And now it's been linked to that suspected Pittsburgh synagogue shooter. Before he allegedly bars into the synagogue and open fire, Robert Bowers posted one last anti-Semitic message on Gab. Gab has since gone offline after web hosting company GoDaddy and other tech companies withdrew their services, but the Gab homepage currently has a statement, part of which states, quote, we are the most censored, smeared, and no platform startup in history, which means we are a threat to the media and to the Silicon Valley oligarchy. Gab isn't going anywhere. Now let's bring in our panel to discuss Bloomberg Technology reporter Josh Brustein, along with Bloomberg contributor David Kirkpatrick, founder of Techonomy and author of The Facebook Effect. And David, I want to um, start with you. When it comes to uh, misinformation, Information. Again, Facebook has been the platform we're looking at, but Gab kind of looks like a, a similar beast here without the moderation that we see Facebook and Twitter pushing into. How do you bridge this gap? How do you keep this stuff from getting out there? There's no question that we've seen sort of the most hateful dialogue moving to these more specialized platforms. And as your previous guests were saying, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, uh, Telegram, these are all new platforms for political distortion. Um, there's no easy answer to what we do. Um, I think we need Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and other major sites to continue their efforts to essentially ensure that hate speech is kept off, particularly threats of violence. One of the things I really worry about is a site like Gab, which has no resources, which is very small, which primarily attracts people with very fringe views. It doesn't even have the, the financial capability to really do the moderation if they were to, for example, say, you cannot make threats of violence here. They clearly haven't been doing that. So that's why this got through. And, and I can't help but ask myself if, if this is what Gab would be like if uh, there was no, if it, what Facebook would be like if there was no moderation. They would look like a Gab. I mean, Josh, Facebook has dragged its feet on calling itself a media company. They've been slow to get into the, the content moderation game. Is this kind of fuel for them to take a closer look at wh what exactly is going on the site and put the resources that a lot of folks have been calling for to kind of keep an eye on things. Yeah, I think all of the larger social media platforms are really trying to say the right things about this. Over the last um, year or two, they've kind of increasingly owned up to it, at least rhetorically, and said, we're going to try what we're doing. We're going to try to do something different. They're not quite sure what to do, and so that's why you're seeing it be difficult. Meanwhile, with Gab, what you're seeing is a lot of how these companies talked, you know, before they realized they were important, saying, hey, people are going to say what they're going to say, and we're just a conduit. And I mean, the idea of, of being a, a haven for free speech is, it seems like kind of a noble statement here from Gab. How, again, how are folks like uh, out in the world, users who are reading, supposed to parse through what is real and, and what is not? 
Yeah, I think with Gab in particular, it's worthwhile to point out that they have two sort of conflicting messages that they will make. The first is that we'll say, we're a free speech platform. How can you possibly um, be against that? And at the same time, their CEO, Andrew Torba, is sort of very familiar with the sort of standard, angry, right-wing rhetoric. Um, he's very comfortable in those worlds. And so he'll say these, um, he'll sort of say those things while also giving him distance from those things and saying, well, you can put anything you want on Gab, so you can't really hold me accountable. And, and David, a lot of these platforms, I mean, a platform used to just be a platform, right? There was no moderation. That was kind of the beauty of, of these uh, social media sharing sites, the internet itself. Folks are picking their camps now. Uh, what does this, all of this say about the ecosystem of the internet these days? Um, who is a media company who is not, is that even a thing? No, I think that's a really important question. I personally believe, talking to a lot of people about Facebook almost every day, that Facebook's only recourse to the problems that it faces with hate speech, with political manipulation, is to move more and more towards viewing itself as a media company, which means it's responsible for what's there, but the volume of stuff that's there is so gigantic that they will need an amazing number of new employees as well as every last tool that artificial intelligence can give them, and even then they probably won't be able to keep it down. I mean, your, answer, your question before about what do we do about misinformation, unfortunately, at the moment, we really don't have the answer to that, and that's scary. And I want to get to something in terms of the knock-on effect of this. Obviously, the alleged uh, Pittsburgh shooter uh, posted on a, on a site or posting on social media sites, we folks don't want that out there. Uh, lots of folks don't want that out there. But is there fear that tech companies start to tread into knocking out content and kind of starting an uproar about uh, them being the gatekeepers? Well, that's what happens when you're a media company. I mean, you could not, the New York Times is not going to publish an article or Bloomberg's not going to put on here somebody who's advocating violence against Jews. I mean, that's the prerogative and the responsibility of a major media company. Now, unfortunately, we have these very marginal, little, low-financed, right-wing oriented sites like Gab and there's others that really would like to see their usage increased by incendiary content. So that's the problem. Well, Techonomy's David Kirkpatrick and Bloomberg Technologies' Joss Brustein, thank you for joining us. Coming up, SoftBank's Saudi Arabian conundrum. How will Masayoshi's son balance major investments from the kingdom in his vision fund with the furor over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi? We'll discuss that next. Plus, Apple is set to give two of its product lines some much-needed upgrades at Tuesday's New York event. We'll discuss everything rumored so far. This is Bloomberg. As the details of journalist Jamal Khashoggi's murder continue to unfold, SoftBank has found itself entangled in controversy. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund is the biggest investor in SoftBank's $100 billion vision fund. The cornerstone of the Japanese investments companies like Uber and WeWork. And now the PIF is planning to invest an estimated $45 billion into a second SoftBank fund. But as the Khashoggi killing sparks debate throughout the globe, ties to Saudi money threaten the vision fund's future. CEO Masayoshi's son has already canceled his speech at Saudi Arabia's investment conference, casting doubt on the future of the Vision Fund and SoftBank's relationship with the kingdom. Joining us now to discuss is Unusual Ventures co-founder and managing partner, John Veronis. John, I, I'm curious about this. We always hear from VCs that they are kind of the backers of the executives and their portfolio companies, but now LPs are in the spotlight. How much concern is uh, the Saudi backing in the Vision Fund? Fund, is it something that's really having a visceral reaction in the Valley? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic that the conversation is really uh, reaching the, the heights that it is. We're now talking about where the money comes from, and I think it's good for the ecosystem. And a conversation is one thing, but uh, action might be another. Is there fear that folks don't want somebody like SoftBank with its LP partner, uh, Saudi Arabia, in their cap table? Will companies turn down investment from these massive funds because they don't like who they're aligning with? You know, I think the best entrepreneurs always have a choice. And what we're learning is that they're starting to ask the question about where the VC's monies come from. Uh, and most entrepreneurs are very mission driven and so it matters to them uh, the track records of some of the LPs that are involved now with some of the most prominent VCs.
I'm curious, uh, Masayoshi Son has used his kind of um, per position of, of investment grandeur to make some change. Is there a possibility that he could actually go out and, and try to affect change in Saudi Arabia? Is that something you see out of Son? Wow, I don't know that I'm qualified to say <laughs> what, he, what he's going to do in Saudi Arabia, so. <laughs> Well, then let me, let me talk to something that Unusual Ventures is uh, an expert in. Your LPs are chosen in a very particular manner. You're very conscious of who is backing your funds. Can you talk us through a little bit about why uh, you've chosen to do something that, uh, frankly, is, is unusual? Folks are selective, but maybe not quite as much as you've been. You know, I think entrepreneurs are our most precious resource. And as a venture capitalist, you really work for two constituents. You work for the entrepreneurs, and then you work for the investors who give you money. And so when we started Unusual, we felt there was an opportunity to do something that was better for entrepreneurs. But we also felt the responsibility to drive the industry forward. And that had everything to do with diversity of the venture capitalists themselves to where the money comes from and where that wealth creation ends up after the fact. We feel like it's one of the most uh, impactful places where we'll see growth in the economy going forward. And so at Unusual, we deliberately went to children's hospitals, historically black colleges, foundations, because we wanted to be working for them and we believed our entrepreneurs would care about that. So one of the, the best kind of quotes of the year in my mind was when Bill Gurley was talking to um, Bloomberg Tech anchor Emily Chang back at the Goldman Conference earlier this year. He said something that I've seen, but he kind of put into good words, uh, that uh, VCs these days uh, want to be in the best companies, and so they're perhaps not putting as much pressure on management teams when it comes to governance as perhaps an investor should. Are we at an inflection point here where uh, VCs should be kind of taking a tougher stance, even if that means uh, the next deal down the road, they're not given that, that stake and that spot in, uh, in a company? Well, well, Bill's a smart guy and he's been doing this a long time. You know, I, I think that the best entrepreneurs are going to a start asking the question, and that's really what it's about. We start with transparency. It's, it's not different than the gender equality issue that we've been talking about a lot the past year. The entrepreneurs didn't used to always ask about that, and so now you're seeing them step up and say, hey, how about that gender equality at your firm? I think similarly, you're gonna see the same thing with the investor base. And so I think, yeah, you will see VCs thinking a lot more about where they take that money and the entrepreneurs they work with. And that's, that's where this all starts. That's where the change begins. Quickly here, are you seeing um, CEOs ask you about your LPs more often these days, or are they caring about who is backing the ones who are backing them? In the past week, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this has been an amazing uh, surfacing of the issue, and there's a real backlash. And I think from our perspective, it's great. Well, that is Unusual Ventures co-founder and managing partner, John Veronis. Thank you for joining us. And coming up, Apple is releasing even more hardware before the holiday season. What updates to expect with the iPad and the MacBook next? This is Bloomberg. Apple may have released its latest phones and watches last month, but the company isn't stopping there. On Tuesday, the tech giant is hosting a second event here in Brooklyn, New York, where it's expected to launch a slew of new hardware. And at the center of the stage will be the revamped iPad Pros with Face ID, a new laptop to replace the MacBook Air, and a new Mac Mini for professionals. All three product updates come after several years without notable changes, as the iPhone continues to drive sales. Here to discuss is Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman. Mark, you are our in-house expert on all things Apple gadgetry. What exactly are folks going to be most excited about? What are folks expecting out of this event here in New York? Exactly what you said. I couldn't have said it better myself. The, the two main things will be the new iPad Pro as well as a new low-cost 13-inch laptop, which will basically be a successor to the MacBook Air. And it, these come at an interesting time because neither of these products have seen notable updates in quite some time. Uh, if you look at the MacBook Air, the last time there was a major revamp to that product was back in 2010. And to give some you know, timing to that, Steve Jobs actually announced that and it was one of the last products uh, that he announced as CEO. The iPad Pro hasn't seen notable changes really since it was introduced in 2015 
there was a big upgrade, not too notable, but you know, a fair size upgrade back in 2017, but this will be the biggest revamp in the product's history. So in the scope of Apple, as you said, these are not kind of the, uh, the products that they've been most uh, uh, refreshing the most. How do these kind of fit in in the scope of Apple's products set? How important are these two new offerings? Well, they're, they're extremely important, and it's, it's very interesting because when the iPad first came out, they were sort of positioning it as the future of the computer, right? But we have not actually seen that. This device peaked at about 26 million unit sales back in the holiday quarter in 2014. Now they're at 13 million in the holiday quarter of 2018. So sales have fallen in half in just four years. So they really need to revitalize the category if they really are going to continue pinning the future of computing on the device. And Mark, I know you love to go deep on what exactly is new in these products, especially the iPad Pro, given that it, it hasn't replaced the computer as it was kind of meant to do. What specific things are new about this new iPad that folks should be getting more excited about? Sure, I'll give you my, my bullet point list. So the main thing will be Face ID, facial recognition, removing the home button, a new gesture-based interface. Think of it as if you're using an iPhone 10 or 10s or 10R now, it's a jumbo version of that now, just like the older iPads were jumbo versions of the previous iPhones. Uh, upgraded rear camera, perhaps with that portrait mode feature for that bouquet effect. Uh, there's going to be a new charger, so they're going to be changing the connector uh, for the first time in six years on the iPad. That's sure to cause uh, a little bit of a firestorm for some people needing to buy all new cables and new ports. They'll be going from the lightning connector, which is on the iPhone, to a USB-C connector, which they use on some of the latest MacBooks. So now, if you own the new iPad and the new iPhone, you're going to need two different chargers. So it's going to be interesting to see how Apple explains that. Uh, also, faster processor, new graphics chip, all the other various odds and ends. And then for the Apple Pencil fans, there will be a new version of that too. Uh, it will have some touch control gestures on the side, so you'll be able to slide your finger across it to change the brush stroke size. Uh, while you're drawing in some of the, the latest apps like Photoshop. Well, uh, portrait mode on the iPad, perhaps we'll see some of those out in the wild taking those nice portrait pictures. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you for joining. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for full coverage of Facebook earnings after the bell. We'll also bring you all the headlines from that Apple event we just discussed. I'm Alex Barinka, and this is Bloomberg.